Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the virtual book launch of San Bernardino Singing. This is an Inlandia event, and if you're new to Inlandia, Inlandia Institute is a literary nonprofit organization that serves the Inland Empire with literary events and publishing. My name is Christina Guillen. I'm the programs coordinator for Inlandia, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's guests, Gail Brandeis, Liz Gonzalez, and Christine Chatterton. We're gonna hear from Gail first, if you would please introduce yourself and make a comment about your connection to the book, your piece that you have contributed. Welcome, Gail. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here with all of you today and to uh, yeah, see some of my Inlandia peeps. I miss being in Inlandia. I'm up in Lake Tahoe now. Um, I had the honor of being in Landia Literary Laureate from 2012 to 2014. So this organization and this region means so much to me. Um, I have a short story called The Wash within the anthology that had originally been in um, Phantom Seed, Ruth Nolan's publication um, out in the desert. And I'm delighted that it was reprinted in this anthology, which is so beautiful. I just got my copy today. And um, I'll, I'll tell you more about the story later. All right. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Gail. Next, can I hear from Liz Gonzalez? Welcome. And let's please unmute. Hi, everybody. Your... I'm Liz Gonzalez, uh, written all lowercase with all Zs. Thank you to everyone in Inlandia Institute who's involved with San Bernardino singing from concept to completion and beyond. I grew up in San Bernardino and Rialto. On my mother's side, I have roots in the West Sides Our Lady of Guadalupe neighborhood that go back to the early 1900s. Mama attended SBVC in the late 50s, and I graduated from SBVC in the late 80s. Represent. I'm thrilled and grateful that two of my pieces appear in the anthology, a short story entitled Sweethearts, based on my grandparents' clandestine romance in the 1920s, and a poem based on the Santa Ana winds and fire in the chaparral in San Bernardino. Wonderful, thank you. Christine, welcome. Okay. Go ahead, Christine. Yeah. My name is Christine Chatterton. Mm -hmm. I have two uh, poems in the anthology. I was really uh, glad to have a part in it. Um, my son also has a couple of poems uh, in it, Micah Chatterton, but he couldn't be here today. Uh, but I just really appreciate this anthology because it, it hits an area that often gets looked down upon, you know, San Bernardino and uh, city and county is kind of like the poor cousins of LA, you know, <laughs> lots of times they, they view it that way. And I, uh, I think that it has so much to offer. Um, I'm glad to be a part of that. Christine, and welcome to everyone. I wanted to start with Christine, um, your poem on the egg. I thought that just a moment so that I can that your poem on the edge it talks about change and it talks about um the edges from city nature and the people that live on edges and i was wondering if you could on the uh, your poem. we go actually um my husband and i go to the oldest protestant church in san bernardino and at one time, it, it's a huge, beautiful church um, in downtown San Bernardino. And one time it was full of people. But over time, there has been so much change in San Bernardino itself that uh, it's only about half full now, if that, you know. 
And um, I'm going to give them one of these anthologies because I was talking to people in a group there and they were saying how when people, so many people had moved away, when jobs moved away, the, the railroad jobs moved away and then the military jobs moved away. And uh, it, was, it was just sad to see all the changes and how it affected the city. And that's what I wanted to write about. Um, there's one part, uh, one verse, I'll just read one verse from the poem. Sure. Uh, city built up on the edge, the edge of the freeways and houses and crowds, sprawling malls and tall towers, mansions on hills, the edge of the massive metropolis that is that brash city, L.A., the small farm town swallowed up by the crowd, the old town still trying to be themselves, San Bernardino, the hub of the towns, half old now, half new, half growing, half falling into disuse, Change is relentless. The metropolis spreads out. Either change or develop into something brand new. The small bungalows and neighborhoods don't fit into that new metro vision. All houses and no yards. The muscular hard labor jobs are gone. Steel workers, railroad workers, builders and growers and soldiers are gone. New jobs come slowly, but slowly they do come. Warehouses, offices, truckers, and jobs fit for the edge. Mm. And that's kind of the way I see it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, that abstract. Um, and you also mentioned in that poem that uh, the people that have remained are um, strong and yeah, you know, the, the, it's, it's actually a very strong community uh, that's still there. And a lot of our uh, best friends are have been there for 30, 40 years or more, you know. And there is a strong uh, group of people that are trying to, you know, fit the changing conditions. I think that's really good. Right. And what that brought to mind to me was I've heard in a lot of Native American circles that um, edges are where there's the most chance for growth because of the, the significant amount of change that takes place. And that um, like looking at the edge of an ocean, edges of water, and here we have the edge of cities and such change that ha happens because of um, the metropolis down the road. Um, so it's an interesting and, way to look at it. Yeah, and and the edge, it's like San Bernardino is the edge of nature too, because all around us, the mountains kind of are surrounding us on, on three sides. And it's just, it's nice because you can be up into the mountain areas really quickly. Thank you. Well, thank you for bringing that unique perspective in with your poem. I want to turn to Gail and Gail's piece. So Gail wrote a piece called The Wash. And um, at first I thought it was fiction, but then I wasn't entirely sure. And sometimes reality can be stranger than fiction. So I wanted to turn it over to Gail and hear more about her piece. Oh, just a second, Gail. Okay. There we All go. right. I just unmuted myself. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, your instinct was partially right in that this is a semi-autobiographical story, but then I took it to a place that is not autobiographical. Um, the part that, that is true to life is when I was in college, I went to the University of Redlands. Um, which was a wonderful experience. That's what brought me out to Inlandia in the first place. I grew up in the Chicago area and um, ended up coming out here thinking I would just be out here for four years and then go home. 
but I stayed for almost 30 years, um, <laughs> which, you know, it's, it's a place that means so much to me. Um, but while I was a student, I had a friend who would play these war games out in the wash with tubing and they would throw water balloons at each other. And he, um, he and I drove out to a medical supply store one time to get this tubing and he asked me to marry him. And this was a fellow I hadn't dated or anything. We were just good friends. But the moment stayed with me, and I can still hear all these years later, I can still hear the sort of sing-song tone of his voice when he asked me to marry him. And he was just kind of like, let's get married. And, <laughs> you know, I didn't take him seriously, of course, and I don't think he was serious. But, but the moment just stayed with me somehow. And so I decided, you know, as we can do with fiction, to play with those what-ifs. What if we did get married? And then what if, you know, something horrible happened during these war games? Um, so it was taking a real experience, but then taking an imaginative leap out of that experience. Okay, well, that makes sense. Thank you for expounding on that. Um, you know, and I like how you put that, that it was kind of like a sing-song way, because that's kind of how the story, it's very playful with the ring pop ring for the engagement or the wedding ring and um, all of the details. It's a very detailed story, especially while they're in the wedding chapel with the mayonnaise on the man's face and the woman's holy slippers. There's so many details that seem so mundane and ordinary, but when you get to the end of the story with the change that happens being so drastic, it just um, somehow makes everything more real and brings a, a different perspective to the mundane. And uh, that you say that that moment stuck with you. I think maybe that was your way of um, immortalizing that moment in fiction. Yeah, yeah, it was a very sweet little moment. And the story that came out of it isn't necessarily a sweet little story. <laughs> Parts of it are. But thank you for mentioning the details. I, I love trying to find details that will be as illuminating as possible about the world and the characters. And um, so the reader can kind of bring their body into the story and, and feel immersed within it. Mm. I think we have a raised hand. Okay, Dinaz. Yeah, hi Gail. Hi. This is Dinaz. So I was lovely lucky to enough for you to publish one of my poems, but I'm talking about Fabulous, fabulous short story. So many different uh, emotions and ideas sort of swirled around inside me as I read this short story. Sort of the spontaneity of youth, and but the end sort of brings it all together. Um, the reality of the experience, where it actually looks like a diamond, and you wonder what is reality, what is real and what isn't, and you look at things from different lenses. And then I looked at that, the, the sort of juxtaposition of the rock and the balloon, and the rock is somehow, you know, it's, 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 uh, it stands for, uh, for violence and it stands for war. Um, the balloon is something you would associate with birthday parties and a picnic and peace. And I was wondering what were some of the other thoughts that came to your mind when you wrote about this? Oh my goodness. Well, I love your interpretation. So um, it's been a while since I wrote the story. So it's hard to remember exactly what came to mind at the time, other than just trying to bring myself right there and, and to play too with, um, you know, the way love can be woven into friendship, the way toward the end of it, you know, I feel like she, yeah, as, you, as you noted, um, realizes that she truly loved this friend of hers and that she's, um, you know, she's heartbroken <laughs> um, at the end. And I, I wish I had something more intelligent to say about the imagery and what I, I wanted to pour into it, but I feel like that process happened a while ago and I'm not sure I have access to it anymore. Um, but as I wrote, I, I tried to trust the images that, that wanted to arise. 
and uh, to allow them to have, you know, their various layers. Um, so I so appreciate you sharing what you saw within the story. That means so much. And, and I almost feel as if, um, you know, you have a better grasp of the story than I do. <laughs> a lot of times I feel like the writing is more intelligent than I am. The writing knows what it's doing and I just have to kind of get out of my own way and, and allow the work to become its fullest self. And of course, I, I consciously choose how to um, to revise it so it can, so the images can really sing as much as possible, and so the meaning can come through. But a lot of the process is so mysterious too, and I think sometimes images, um, they'll arise out of the subconscious and have a lot of meaning built into them that I might not have even been thinking of as I was writing, but later realized that that those subconscious layers were there. Mm. Very well said. And, you know, your poem or your story has um, sprinkled throughout it some images of San Bernardino. So you have the dry riverbed, the white rocks, and the the hitching post, which, is that a real place? Is that? It was a real place. Yeah, it used to exist. Um, I don't know if it still does. So had you, you must have gone inside or did you imagine that whole <laughs> I, think, I think I imagined it I've just I just saw it from the outside and I I took that imaginative leap but I would see it as um, I, I often would go up the mountains um, to go hang gliding so my first husband when he was my boyfriend at the time um, was an avid hang glider mm -hmm. and so we would drive up the mountain and fly down and uh, we would pass the hitching post on the way, um, and that became part of part of the journey. And it just that was another thing that just kind of lodged into my brain as an interesting detail. I was always curious about it when I drove past. Yeah. Oh wow, you're very brave. <laughs> the worst um, part was going through the smog. The, the the worst parts were just before you jump off the the mountain because that was really scary to stand on the edge of a cliff and jump off of it. But then the other worst part was hitting that inversion layer where the smog, you could see that layer of smog across the valley and knowing that you're about to dive through it was, was always slightly um, disturbing. <laughs> yeah, and I bet you had a good view of the town or yes. of the, the landscape. Definitely, definitely. And that landscape still feels so present inside of me, even though it's been a few years since I've lived there. I can conjure it up so vividly within me. Oh, wow. And also, um, Liz Gonzalez's piece has a lot of imagery from the natural landscape that she weaves within her, um, well, my interpretation was that it was a, a love a love story or maybe a relationship between um, something else and the, uh, the seasons or the changes, the, the natural changes throughout Let's hear from Liz Gonzalez about her piece. Uh, um, uh, so you're referring to the poem? Yes. Yeah, because yeah, I have two pieces. One, The Sweethearts, that's based on my grandparents' clandestine romance. And um, Fall in the Chaparral is, oh. um, is a metaphor for a romantic relationship that is experiencing some strife. And so it's when my husband and I first moved in together, you have two headstrong people who had been together for, you know, had been, uh, were the eldest in our family. And so it was the first time we both lived with somebody. And, and uh, so then I just thought, oh, this, like, this reminds me of what's going, you know, what it's like when the Santa Ana winds are hitting and the fires, although it's, it's, it's more violent than what was happening with us, but it felt like that, like so tumultuous. Yeah. I thought you did a really beautiful job of weaving those two elements and, and they almost became like um, inseparable. You could, you could feel that tumultuous part of the relationship, but then you could feel it coming back together and, I like how you compared it to the season, to the fall. That was very well done. Do you want Thank to speak you. on your other piece as well? 
Um, well, the other piece is based on my grandmother's oral history, which she told me uh, from the 1990s through the 2000s, I would go to her home on the bench in San Bernardino, which is now considered part of Rialto, and uh, just hang out with her and she would tell me her stories. And then she gave me permission to write them. Mm. And the, it takes place in the West Side in the mid 1920s. Um, may I read a little bit of that piece? Yes, you can read a little bit. Yeah. And then we'll go to the video in just a little bit. Okay. Sweethearts, West Side, 1926. Oh, I was ready for him that afternoon. My parents stepped outside the store to take my little brothers and sisters to the fiesta at the park up the street and I followed them to the front walk with the broom. I swept and watched them until they had walked two blocks away. Then I glanced out of the corner of my eye toward John's house across the street and saw him peeking through his front window. He knew it would be safe to come and talk to me. I walked back inside the store, slow, like nothing was happening. Once inside, I ran across the store into the stock room and pulled out the clothes I had hidden behind some boxes and changed out of my apron and work dress. As fast as I could, I stepped into my prettiest dress, maroon with a pleated skirt. Mama made it for me for Christmas. My fingers trembled, making it hard to fasten the hooks and eyes on the side of my dress. It was chilly in the store, but I didn't have to cover it up with the sweater. I was hot from excitement. Next, I slipped on my good black shoes with the heel to make me tall and slim. Standing in front of the mirror hanging on the wall, I painted pomegranate red lipstick on my lips and rubbed some onto my cheeks. Then I wiped my index finger on the soot I collected in an empty matchbox and brushed the soot on my eyelashes. I was fixing one of my ringlets when I heard the bell on the front door tinkle. Thank you for sharing that. Dinaz has a comment to make. Dinaz, if you'd like to speak, you can talk now. I'd love to. Hi, Liz. This is Dina. Hi. I wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed your poem, Paul in the Chaparral. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I see the parallels between the, you know, the Santa Ana devastation and the, the human devastation inside the home, the lack of cool water in the landscape compared to, I guess, the, the loveless, lovelessness of the interior relationship. And I love the way you just interwe interweave both of those separate worlds. It's a lovely poem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, oh. oh, and there's one question here um, that talks about the future of San Bernardino. And this is jumping off of Christine's poem, talking about San Bernardino being on the edge, figuratively, geographically, and respect to change. I sense a feeling of nostalgia and eagerness to preserve the past while longing for change at the same time. I wonder what you who live, work, or have spent many years in San Bernardino envision the future of San Bernardino to be. So we can, if anyone wants to answer that question. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, okay. Christine. I, I think that they're definitely on the upside. I've seen so many uh, new types of jobs coming in. Uh, I have friends and my son who work for warehouses, you know, uh, which is the main job that's coming into the area. But it, it also is so nice to know that there is this nucleus of people who are not giving up, who are, you know, ready and, and willing to uh, work with San Bernardino, uh, and 
uh, I'm in a writing group there. There's people that are writing about San Bernardino and, and it's just good to know that there is that group of people willing to keep working on things. Mm. It's, it's a little bit different. Uh, on Monday, you talked about how different Riverside, someone talked about how different Riverside was than uh, San Bernardino. I think there is a difference in those two communities. Riverside has always been the more uh, tourist upscale and uh, orchards, a lot of orchards, um, you know, had has always had a different feel than San Bernardino. And I think there's a lot to be offered here. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I think we're going to jump to the video just for the sake of time because um, the video is going to take a second to play. It's um, about 10 minutes or 11 minutes. So, so I will, um, I'm just, this is Katie, in case you can't see me, but I'm the voice from the beyond. I'm going to share the video, but it's about 11 minutes long. So um, you're welcome to stay and watch the whole thing, or if you have to jump off. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to, to put more questions in the Q&A. And with that, I'll go ahead and hit play. There's some really good stuff in here. Love song for Bobby Soto. I guess you have to be an alcoholic to understand, he said by way of passing. I guess, I replied, wondering if this tragic romanticism quote to all alcoholics or just the artistic one. We were driving down Mount Vernon, sitting way up in his big trunk like kings, surveying the Botanicas, the Carnicerias, the Anterias, painted yellow and fuchsia and that fussy cobalt blue. The sun shone so white it hurt. Oscillating, breaking, the surge and crest and retreat, a worry like a Philip Glass song played by the Chromos Quartet, dosed on two grams of methamphetamine. The sawing up and down, the spiking heat, and the blue notes of the soundtrack, or the peaks and valleys, of a startled afternoon, dragging the rest of the day like a sack of rusted auto parts. This is where we are. Buzzards dressed like realtors, circling above the humble scavengers of change, mauling the carry in the family court, hiding thousands in their secret bank accounts. The crows dyed ochre and silver. The cotton blossoms of concern trudging, pushing shopping carts full of burning newspapers down the length of the shimmering afternoon. I said, you gotta hand it to the human spirit, even with the war going on and all the other crap, people still open up their tienditas, their quinceanera shops, their places to sell piñatas for a kid's birthday. You fool, he laughed. These businesses are all just fronts. In the bag, they're laundering money, or they got some little those held hostage for 2,000 ransom. I guess, I said, as we passed the church, where a short line of white cars idled in front of the vestibule. The drivers in white shirts and black vests waited, wiped backs of their necks. You guess, he laughed. You guess. Though they hissed like wasps trapped in the cab of the truck. I let the taunts go. I had to. Their sting would have only amplified the weak swat of my reply. I guess, I said. Knowing I'd be judged by the harsh tautology, but I refused to burrow into the low cynicism of all of those times. Give teeth to the lie, lip the lispy Heil Hitler, 
to explain the irrational cruelty that finds its way passing through the anesthetized cities, the way alcoholics pass shoe polish and paint them through white bread to distill the anxiety and keep the spirit strong. When we die and go to heaven, will we still be together? It's a song he sings when he's worried. He doesn't mean me and him. He means somebody else or nobody else. Or else he just means himself. He sang it then and I pictured us riding high in his F-250 on streets paved with gold. The angel gangs toking up on the corners where the placas on the walls all looked like Las Iquitos, Las Quiats. Heaven, he said, is just like the farm. The fence is easy enough to climb, but nobody ever does. If you do, then they add another five years. It's not worth it, he says. I'm sure I'm never going back. My name is Adam Daniel Martinez, and this poem is called Santa Fe Whistle. I've roved around, but here you remain in the same bed you slept in. All these years, I'm reminded upon return. Death is near. Home is queer after a while. It no longer exists. You just float along like stagnant water in urban lakes or putrid ponds. Where people pour pollution and graffiti lines the public restroom walls, clear signs of a poor economy. A few miles from where Mago sleeps sits Seacombe Lake. Once a pristine park near a presently dilapidated downtown San Bernardino, my parents took me to feed the ducks, old hard bread, now a haven for vagrants, vandalism, and violent crimes. Druggies and hoes earn cash in an urn with ash. Divers comb the muck for evidence of a holy war. Mago made a living working many years at Santa Fe Depot. I miss hearing that whistle blow. Hello, this is Wando Battle. I'll be reading Dear Villagas. I'll be reading the second part of the whole song. Dear Villagas. Hey, Dear Villagas. Sprawling is already all, all around us. Lot de abandonado. Pedidos y encontrados. That dog guarding el mismo gate, barking as if we're not beyond the fence in the view. No somos salvajes. That girl walking past another barrio sings at niños blanco y marrón. No that hierba, that savor. Hey, that girl walking past another barrio lot, the bedroom like us. Abandonado, sings at niños blanco y marrón. Pedidos y encontrados. Know that sprawling yerba, that dog guarding at mismo gate, barking as if we're not already beyond the fencing with you. No somos salvajes, let's save her around us. Interesting. I married a San Bernardinian. Sometimes when we are asleep, I am afraid a mountain will rise from within you. Your eyelids still carry the dust that was brought with the evening winds. Your eyes turn gray like the smoky skies that appeared above the schoolyard when you were a child. Whole cities surrounding San Marino swept their smog into it. The smog so unbearable, they canceled P class. In your dreams, you return to your grandfather's house on Tanner Circle. You are six years old. You play at the back where the orange groves used to be. You become lost between branches of barren trees. Your cousin Mikey is with you, climbing the dirt mounds formed from skeletons of orange or tree. In your memories, you walk down 9th Street to Our Lady of Guadalupe Trine Church where you were an altar boy, where your grandfather is still a deacon, where after mass your family went with their own olla to get offerings a menudo from Zacatecas Cafe. 
When we go back to visit off the freeway, every time you see Mount Vernon Avenue, you find yourself on the passenger side of a car, your friend Emilio at the wheel. He drives down the hill at 75 miles per hour on a dare, crashes at the bottom. A fire engulfs the car. Sometimes in your mind, you don't make it out of that fire. Hello, my name is James Luna. I grew up on the west side of San Bernardino, and my contribution for this anthology is a poem entitled The Santa Fe Whistle. By way of author's note for this poem, the setting is a time before 24 hour cartoon TV channels. When I was a kid, if I wanted to watch cartoons, I'd only have time between 3 and 5 p.m. Let's begin. 2.57 p.m. He stands in the parking lot of the Church of Our Lady of Guadalupe with his dad watching an usher dressed as a centurion yell at the teenager undressed as Jesus while his mom with the rest of the Guadalupanas stir pots of lentils, fry no palace, and check the copy of Adala and pray there will be enough. 3 p.m., two miles away, the whistle. At the Santa Fe yard, howls and suspicious overtones at the workers. Breaks over. His nine-year-old ears intuit that sound as the only time he patrols the television. The bear in the fedora, the Neolithic family, the talking gray rabbit, each chasing, shooting, exploding each other with comic immortality. Except for today, the first Friday, after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox. The teenager hangs his head, and everyone, including the boy, kneels on the pavement. His stomach growls, because in his religion, he cannot eat until his savior has died. Okay, thank you, Katie, for the reading. Um, there's a message here about the question that was posed earlier about the future of San Bernardino and it looks bright. I wanted to give Liz a chance to refer to her um, message for everybody. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, saw, I posted it first for the panelists and then I added it to the panelists. Anyways, it got messed up. So there are so many great things happening in San Bernardino right now. And like uh, Christine said, there are people doing great work to improve San Bernardino and arts connection events. Um, uh, the Garcia Center for the Arts, San Bernardino History and Railroad Museum, Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art at CSUSB. And in the west side, there's the events at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, including the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is magnificent. If you've never been, I encourage you to go. And just to see the architecture, the inside of the building, you don't have to be Catholic to appreciate it. And there's just in the Mitla Cafe and there are so many people and wonderful events and I have a uh, Facebook page called Good Happenings in San Bernardino and the IE and I encourage you to check it out because I try to and send me information about events that you have going out on there because I, I post only the good that's happening and there's a lot of it. Well, thank you. That's good news that we all need to hear. And I wanted to mention a, a message from Frances. She's just shouting out, good job to everybody. Thank you all. It was good to see and hear you all. Liz Gonzalez, Gail Brandeis, Kathleen, 
Chatterton and the video poet. San Bernardino sings beautifully. Yay, Nikia Cheney and Inlandia. So yay, everybody. Yay to all of our participants today, our, all of our contributors um, here and in the audience. So please join us again tomorrow, 3 p.m. We will be doing a, another live portion of the virtual launch with Adam Martinez, who is our Hillary Gravendike Prize winner, Keenan Norris, and Ruth Nolan. So congratulations, everyone. Thank you for participating, and um, have a great evening. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. Thank you. Very grateful. See you all tomorrow. Lovely seeing everybody's faces. Bye. Bye.